Thank you very much, Dean Bailey. After your warm introduction and the response, my first impulse is to say I accept the nomination. But uh, I'll restrain myself. And I assure you, if it's uh, sort of homecoming from your point of view, for me to come to Augsburg, it certainly is even more so from my point of view. I first came to Augsburg 25 or 6 years ago when I was trying to prevent the last world war. There still was time. But uh, we couldn't get Americans to support our friends and not support our enemies in the idea that if we supported our enemies, they'd become our friends. And our friends, having seen the, how we treated our enemies, uh, wouldn't become our enemies in order that they could get the same good treatment from it. That's a little complicated, but that was the nature of our policy in those days. It led to Pearl Harbor. Now we're in trouble again. And Dr. Anderson suggested that I talk about the Far East primarily today, partly because that's where the hottest explosions are at the moment. Although they may not be week after next. And because uh, uh, there's less understanding of, perhaps, that part of the world than uh, the countries in Europe and others from which most of us or our forefathers came. Uh, if you answer this question, how are we doing in Asia? Well, some would say, if you're only honest answers, not very well. Uh, some would say we're doing very badly indeed. They think our position in Vietnam is, our government's position is completely wrong. That we're intervening in somebody else's war and endangering an escalation rather than trying to prevent an explanation. Ex escalation. Uh, India and Pakistan, the smoldering struggle there is blown up. Indonesia has pulled away and is putting pressure on Southeast Asia from the south as Red China is putting pressure on from the north. And without our assistance, everybody knows what the outcome would be. Singapore has pulled away from the Malaysian Federation. Uh, Turkey, the Shah of Iran, the king of Afghanistan have resisted with great courage for 40 years going to Moscow. They've gone to Moscow in the last few months. Uh, Red China has the nuclear weapons. Little by little by little, these countries are gravitating toward the communist bloc, thinking the communist bloc knows what it wants. It's on the offensive, and the Western world is just trying to avoid trouble, get along, and you never can win a game just by being on the defensive. They don't, they're doing this reluctantly, but this is their sober conclusion. Now, I don't subscribe to that dark of you. I've seen a lot of patients I thought were going to die. Any way you looked at it, they had infections or this, that, and the other, they couldn't overcome. But doctors don't quit. You keep on working, and every once in a while, you find the old fellow's got tougher constitution than you realize, or some new idea comes along, uh, and you're able to pull them through. You have to admit, uh, I would say it this way, we're doing very well in South Vietnam at the moment. Uh, as long as uh, we hold a strong, consistent position, uh, there's a little bit of rallying around our position. But the great question is, will we hold it, or will we sort of fold up as soon as they smile. Uh, the long-term trend still is away from the free world toward the communists because they know what they're doing. Uh, and the irony is that this showdown, if you call it that, comes at a time when there's so many encouraging things for the free world. Uh, the Asian countries have gone through their uh, readjustments to independence and by and large, their economies were beginning to take off even, at least move forward. They've demonstrated to the world that free peoples under governments of their own choosing can do better economically and every other way, basically, than can the communists. The communist regime is in trouble. It isn't a, it isn't a new system. The Soviet Union's had it 48 years. They got shortages all over the place. They're not short of land. They're not short of resources. 
The Soviet Union is not short of strong, able, industrious, hard-working, competent people. Yet they've got shortages. Something wrong with the system. It doesn't give maximum incentive and opportunity for people to do their best. This is clear. There's been a feud between uh, Korea and Japan, which kept that part of Asia paralyzed. And new leadership in both countries has gradually uh, is in the process of pulling that together, and the treaty has been signed. Some of the students are susceptible to the kind of hoopla that some American students are susceptible to, and both Japan, in both Japan and Korea. They're protesting against the concessions that are being made, but nobody can get a settlement without some bilateral concessions. From both standpoints, it's better than anybody expected could be made. And this is an encouraging thing. Uh, another encouraging thing is that the Soviet Union and Red China are quarreling. That's good. Another encouraging thing is that the African nations, which were so entranced with communism as late as uh, two or three years ago, are mostly disenchanted now. They've discovered that the communists aren't there to really help them. The communists come in to the newly independent government to do to it what they did to Kerensky's government in uh, uh, Russia, what they tried to do to Chiang Kai-shek, they used to say 40 years ago. Chiang Kai-shek is to be the Kerensky of the Chinese revolution. And they tried to make Kenyatta in Kenya, the Kerensky of the Kenyan, revolu Kenya Kenyan revolution. Congo, country after country after country. And these countries are aware of it. I was in Manila two weeks ago for the annual conference of what's called the Asian People's Anti-Communist League. Uh, this is a group of people that started out right after the Korean truce in 53, knowing that nothing had been really settled, and knowing that as long as giant China was there, there was no real stability for them. And they said the communists were day in and day out, instructing their people, keeping them informed, and the free world just takes freedom for granted. So they started this five countries out there, Korea, Free China, Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand. And they've met every year, and it's grown so that this year there were 115 delegates there from 21 countries and observers from private organizations in 14 other countries. Five of those 21 countries are from Africa. I think the one of the best statements made there was a young uh, man strong nationalist from from one of the African countries. Uh, they're seeing through the hypocrisy and the subtle undermining of their own, uh, with which the communists undermine their own government. So these are all encouraging things. And therefore, nobody should uh, throw his hat in the air and nobody should, uh, uh, in despair, give it up. These are problems to be faced and dealt with. Now, perhaps we can deal with Asia uh, in terms of two great transitions going on in our world and three major conflicts, because almost all these explosions here and there are the manifestations in new places of uh, basic forces. The two great transitions are the coming into the gaining of national independence by a billion people in the last 19 years. Nothing like this has ever happened in history before. We began it on July 4th, 1946 in Manila. We pulled down the American flag, ran up the Filipino flag. No bloodshed, no riots, no pressures, parades. This is what we wanted to do. It was in accord with our own history and our own character. Uh, we'd done our best to prepare them for nationhood. We told them we'd give them their independence. We did. Since then, a billion people. It was inevitable once it was started. And if we get up and jump on anybody else, we started this. I'm glad we did. Uh, since then, a billion people have come into nation nationhood. Sixty-some countries. Three new ones admitted to the UN last week. One of them has only a third as many people as there are in the city of Minneapolis. And it isn't economically or politically viable. Uh, yet it has a seat with the same boat as Sweden or Italy or Japan. 
and so on. This is part of a new way of doing things. It's got some good and some bad. It's a fact. But at the same time, the old colonialism, which had run the world for several hundred years, mostly from Western Europe, was disintegrating. A new colonialism has been expanding, and another billion people have lost their independence in the same period of time. And these are not people without previous experience in self-government. People like Latvians and Lithuanians and Poles and Czechs and Hungarians, highly civilized people, mature, long centuries of demonstrated competence in managing their own affairs when given an opportunity. They've lost their independence, while the other billion has gotten its independence. All of history has never known anything like this. Don't be too disturbed at the latest headline when you stop and look at the long-term forces that are at work. Now, in this there are three major conflicts of which most of the others are a little uh, manifestations here and there. One is the conflict between the communist world and the free world. This is the mightiest conflict of history. There have always been conflicts, but this is the first time all continents, all countries, all cultures, all peoples have been involved. Total conflict. And then there's the second conflict, the one within the communist world. And the third is not so much a conflict as it is divisions within the free world. De Gaulle going this way and the Germans a little uncertain there and Britain uncertain and other countries. These older countries are in what Washington calls disarray, which is Washington word for a mess. That's the alliances. Now, it's, I sometimes think that maybe our best hope of getting out of this without a holocaust lies in the conflict within the communist world. I'm very sure our greatest peril lies not in the power or the weapons of the communists, but in the divisions within the free world. If the older free countries, mostly around the North Atlantic, plus Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Israel, a few others, were united, why, there's where the power is. The other side would have to come to negotiate, wouldn't have to plead with them. They'd have to come to negotiate and on the terms of the free world, not the other way around. But here's what we face. I could sometimes, as a doctor, say to a patient, if you hadn't done what you did, you wouldn't have what you got. But that isn't very helpful. He did what he did. He's got what he's got. So I've got to deal with it. Now, the test case in the explosions in Asia is Vietnam at the moment. Three different times in the last 20 years, the test case was Berlin. Under three different presidents, we passed the test. Twice the test was in the Formosan Straits, 1954 and 1958. We passed the test. Once the test was in Lebanon was the focus of it. The pressure of the communists into the Suez, the middle oil of the Middle East, and on into Africa. We passed the test. Three, four times we didn't pass the test. Uh, once the test was the missile case, the missiles in Cuba, we passed that one under a, another president. Vietnam is the test, and it's a test of a fourth president by the name of Lyndon Johnson, and his party, and his administration, those who were in control, and of our people, including the colleges, and the teachers, and the students of America. Now, there's some gains in Asia, or the first is that there is a wider recognition, worldwide, I think, of the importance of Asia. When I stood here 25 years ago and said if we didn't stop selling oil and machines and planes and tanks and not tanks but uh, uh, trucks and scrap iron and stuff to Japan, we'd have a war. Well, a bunch of volcanoes like Japan attacked the great United States. What good Asia do? I didn't blame people for feeling that way, but I'd been under the Japanese militarists in China. I had to report what I'd seen. Asia seemed a long ways away, but we've got into three wars in 25 years, all of them in Asia, while we were looking somewhere else. World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So there's a greater awareness of the importance of Asia as a part of 
A world which now doesn't have five or six main strategic areas, it has one strategic area, the whole globe. And a major breakthrough anywhere will have immediate and disastrous repercussions on all the other parts of it. A second gain is a greater awareness of the crucial importance of China in Asia. This was a long time coming. And if you said this, they said you were a partisan of Chiang Kai-shek, or you were an Asia firster, or you were emotional about Asia. No, just looked at the map. This was a matter of China's geography, China's size, the strength as well as the size of her population, her human resources, and the history of Asia, which people didn't study. Whoever has been master of China has been dominant of Asia, and the Asians all know it. If you look at Asia, and I've been carrying this map around with me a long time now, it's, a, it's like a giant hand. And it, China's the palm of the hand. And out from this hand go 15 fingers instead of five, as go out from my physical palm. Uh, peninsulas and island groups lying around China. Korea, Japan, Formosa, the Philippines. Six down in Southeast Asia, seven if you count North and South Vietnam as two countries. And across the South, Burma, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all of them border on China. In those 15 fingers lie one third of the people of, live one third of the people of the world. Now China is a deficit area in many respects. Uh, she needs a lot of natural resources. Where are they down here? Tin, only oil east of the Persian Gulf. Rubber, rice surpluses. There's a terrific prize. But China, in control of the resources of Southeast Asia, still needs something else, industry. And that's over in this peninsula, Japan or, or island. The third or fourth best industrial workshop in the world. China's size, her strategically advantageous central position, she's the hub of the wheel. She's the key to Asia for the same reason Germany is of Europe. The largest and with the, the hub where, out from which the spokes go and into which they come. As Germany goes, so goes Europe. And as China goes, so goes Asia. You give China control of the resources of Southeast Asia and the industry of Japan, and you have the greatest power potential power complex in our world. This is what it's about, you know. It isn't about no jin gem. It isn't sentimentality. It's a look at the map. That's why it's our war. How are you going to live without it? You pull out of Vietnam, to what do you pull? No place short of Hawaii. Now, if you're prepared to do that, all right, but better take a look at it before you decide to do that. This is real gain, that there's awareness of this. And uh, there's a third gain I would mention. There's an increasing awareness of the nature of communism in China. Not many longer believe that the Chinese communists are simple democratic agrarian reformers, which was the myth that charmed people for so long. Most people now know that communism, the communist regime in China is a total tyranny and that it is a part of a world conspiracy uh, dedicated, openly, committed to world domination. Well, promptly somebody says, isn't there a giant split between Red China and the Soviet Union, the conflict to which I referred earlier? No, it is not a split between Red China and the Soviet Union in the sense of a split between two countries, two nation states. This is one of the errors. Communism is not a national movement. It's an international movement. And one of our greatest mistakes all during the years that has led us with the best of intentions into all sorts of losses is our insistence on believing that all governments will operate in terms of national interests or what their leaders believe to be the interests of their own people. All the governments we ever dealt with in the past did operate that way. And so we assume that if it's governments in Moscow, it must be it's working primarily for the well-being of the Russians. Even though Lenin and the others uh, rejected that. Or if it's a 
government in, my, in Peking, it must be that it's working for the well-being of the Chinese people. And if you help it solve the problems of the well-being of the Chinese people, it'll be content. This was the reason for the errors at Yalta and the various conferences where we made so many contestions to the Soviet Union. For example, they were entitled to be afraid, weren't they? Hadn't they been invaded from their west through Poland by Napoleon and uh, by the Kaiser and by Hitler? Therefore, they're afraid. And if we give them a cordon sanitaire on their west, control of 100 million people, we were not Russians and East Germany, divide it so it can't reconstruct Hitler's militarism, then they'll feel secure and they'll go and work for the well-being of the Russian people and the world can relax. This was the thesis, but it was an error. Communist government isn't interested primarily in the well-being in, in the Soviet Union. Lenin of the well-being of the Russian people. Lenin said uh, when he had to make one of his retreats, uh, he said, we've got to uh, do certain things in the Soviet Union in order to make our base secure, to have socialism successful in one country. Why? So those people will be better off? No. So we'll be in a better position to go to conquer the world. Red China got in trouble. Uh, the communes were pushed too fast. They didn't work. They had to retreat. And people said, oh, they're mellowing. They're maturing. They're evolving. Not a shred of evidence to indicate that. They retreated in order to get greater stability at home, in order to be a better position to move to control of the world. This argument that if you give them their national aspirations, that'll quiet them down, is just like uh, if you, whoever plays the twins finds Versailles on first base, and uh, they say, well, that guy's tough at stealing bases. Let's give him second base, and that'll please him so. He then will try to run to third base. No, no, you better keep him on first base. Now, what is the quarrel between the Red Chinese and the Soviets as we ordinarily speak? It's a quarrel about how to conquer the world. It isn't a national quarrel. Mr. Nehru uh, gave me a long lecture once in 1955 when I was in India, rather condescendingly, because he said, you Americans don't understand the Chinese communists because you're not Asians, you see. He understood them. He was an Asian. He thought. He thought he understood them. I, I made bold to say to him, Mr. Prime Minister, I hope you won't think I'm rude, but I was under the Chinese Communists. I hope you never have that close contact, because if you do, I predict you'll discover that they're not Asians. Mao Zedong was born a Chinese. He's a member of the Chinese race. He speaks the Chinese language. He isn't a Chinese. Working for the well-being of the Chinese people, as you, sir, are working for the well-being of the Indian people, He's a world revolutionist, using China as the base for the world revolution. Mr. Nehru didn't believe it. I didn't blame him for that. He was Red China's best propagandist, advocate, apologist at the UN and everywhere else. And how did his fellow Asians in Peking reciprocate for his generosity? They invaded India, made a shambles of it, of its armed forces. Mr. Nehru, I saw him one month afterward. I said to him, you recall, sir, our previous conversations, how do you account for the fact that after you've been their best friend and helped them uh, get all kinds of concessions to enable China to be more stable, they would do this. He looked up at the ceiling and said, it is very curious. It wasn't curious at all. He thought they were Asians. They're world revolutionists. When you become a communist by act of intellect and will, you reject, otherwise you aren't in your primary loyalty to the nation, whether it's uh, America or England or Canada or Greece or Germany or Russia or China or Vietnam, you work to pull down your government as a part of a world revolution. Mao Zedong has been exporting rice grown by the Chinese and taking it right out of their mouths and exporting it almost every month now for five years. To what country? To what country would you think it'd be so important to export rice? Cuba, to keep the revolution going in the Western Hemisphere. I was in, while I was in Manila, a paper came out in Peking. I don't know whether it was played up here in the United States or not. I saw a headline last night 
about uh, Chen Yi's desperate, blundering, floundering threat of everything of the sort. They're in trouble, they China. But the more serious thing was the article written by Lin Biao. Lin Biao is the vice prime minister of China and minister of defense. It was a 50,000 word article. And the theme of it was this. Mao Zedong, our great genius, took the principles of Marx, Lenin, and Stalin and adapted them for backward countries. Marx talked about the industrialized countries, but the newly independent countries of the world are not industrialized. And the great genius Mao Zedong saw that the way to win these was not by workers of the world revolt and unite. They weren't workers in that sense. It was to organize the countryside under the promise of land and rice and, and peace and liberation and democracy and people's government. Six slogans. In 1947, I was in Peking and I knew, discovered that there was a certain Chinese communist general there in Cognito who had been one of my patients and I managed to get to see him. And I said, how are you gonna come out in this struggle? He said, we're gonna win. I said, what makes you so confident? He said, we have good slogans. John Kaishek doesn't have good slogans. Land, peace, rice, liberation, democracy, people's government. How do you beat that? Lenin took Russia with three of them. Land, peace, bread. Slogans. They understand the importance of this. So uh, Mao Zedong, uh, uses these as the means to get control. And Lin Biao says, just as Mao organized the countryside in China and enveloped and isolated the centers of power where Jiang's troops were. We couldn't defeat Jiang's troops. He had greater power than we had. We enveloped them, isolated them. So, he said, the next step of the world is to apply Mao Zedong's great genius to the world problems. This was published September 4th. He said, the cities, the equivalent of the old Chinese centers of power are United States, Western Europe, and revisionist Soviet Union. He puts them in the same class, condemns them for going in with a capitalist. And what do we do? We're organizing China, we're organizing Africa, we're organizing Latin America from Cuba, and we'll isolate the cities, in quotes, United States, Western Europe, Soviet Union envelop them and they'll have loss of access to world markets and materials. There will be unrest, mass unemployment, and from within the red flag will be raised. Khrushchev said that some years ago. He said the red flag is not going to be raised over your grandchildren by Russians, it's going to be raised by Americans. Now this is what they mean. Don't get jittery. This is what they have in mind. They, they're nice enough like Hitler to write it all out so you can be sure and know. But so many people won't pay attention to it. Now, the split between the gang in Moscow and that in Peking is not over national interests. It's over how to conquer the world. It's primarily over typing, timing. And uh, it isn't on national lines. The same, it's a quarrel between two points of view or two factions within every country. The quarrels among the communists in China. There's a quarrel of the same sort among the communists of the Soviet Union. There's a quarrel among the communists of the United States. Some of us felt this, but we couldn't document it until recently. Some months ago, the Soviet Union, or this is a year now, announced that it had expelled three of the old communist stalwarts. Molotov, Malenkov, he was the first prime minister after uh, Stalin and Kaganovich. Why did it expel them from the party? Because they're Chinese? No, no, they're Russian. But they were on Mao Zedong's side, on the timing, not on Khrushchev's side. And just a year ago last week, the Red Flag, which is the official publication of the Chinese communists in Peking, announced that they had expelled a certain Comrade Young and his associates. Who was Comrade Young? He was dean of the faculty of the academy in Peking, which lays down the proper interpretation of Marxism, Leninism for the Chinese. Why did they expel him? Because he's a Russian? No, he's Chinese. But he was against Mao Zedong's interpretation and for Khrushchev. 
Mao said, you gotta get on with it. The revolution doesn't come by legal and parliamentary means. It never has. It comes by violence. And what was Khrushchev's answer when he was still in power? Quote, our Chinese comrades are endangering the victory of world communism by advocating armed revolutions prematurely before there exist proper revolutionary situations, unquote. That's very clear. He was saying, Mao Zedong, please keep still. Don't make speeches like Chen Yi made yesterday and alert the world what we have in mind. Let me put the world to sleep with tranquilizers, relaxations of tensions, uh, talks about disarmament without ever getting anywhere. And let them think we're mellowing and maturing until we get more countries than Latin America and we get more countries than Africa and the Americans get tired and pull out of Vietnam. They are, will, will, won't they? A lot of senators and others are advocating that. And then de Gaulle pulls Europe to pieces. NATO is disorganized. All the continents are in turmoil and divided. That's the time for the revolution, not now. And we'll win the world. We won't have to use the weapons of mass destruction. We'll win the world by the threat of them, coupled with the divisions in the free world. Now, if I have two doctors, one's trying to get me well and one's trying to kill me, that's a life and death importance. But if their only disagreement is on which is the quickest and surest way to kill me, I inter I'm interested, but I don't get too much comfort out of that disagreement. <laughs> and that's what the quarrel's about. It's also in the Communist Party in the United States. They've split. For a long time they quarreled, and last May, I think it was, two or three months ago, they split officially. And uh, a splitter broke off from the Communist Party, calls itself the Progressive Labor Party. It's following the Moscow line on timing, whether you go around the right end or the left end, whether you use force or forward passes and trick plays. But they're both expecting to win. Now, what will be the outcome of this struggle? Well, there could be a breakup and a war. Some Americans wishfully hope that. I don't think that's happened. Will happen. This would be committing suicide. Each would have to spend so much time watching the other it couldn't get on with the world revolution. They can't afford a breakup. There could be a patch-up, but they've gone so far this would be very difficult. Much more likely is they'll go along as they are, side by side, each trying to prove he's right. And if either wins, that's the ball game, even if it proves the other is wrong. We lose. And this is what they're doing in Cuba. The Russian are training the Cubans in the use of the submarines which uh, the Russians and the Cubans, for which they have built, uh, converted these caves into submarine pens, and last summer uh, towed a, a, a dockyard across from the Baltic uh, to handle submarines in the Western Hemisphere. The Russians are doing this. Side by side are Chinese communists training guerrillas from Latin American countries, uh, training them and arming them, and transporting them, and supplying them, and directing them, as the same Chinese communists trained the Viet Cong who were killing Americans in South Vietnam. And Mr. Castro, I've talked about this twice on my daily broadcast, Mr. Castro twice has announced that his country, Viet, uh, Cuba, is to be to South America what North Vietnam is to South Vietnam, the place from which the revolution, subversion of Latin America is carried on. I apologize, in a sense, for an awful lot of involved things, but if you put these things together, they don't, they're not in conflict. There's a head and tail, there's a consistent pattern. It's very difficult to deal with, but not basically complicated at all, if we'll examine the fundamentals. Now, Here's the problem. What's been our U.S. policy? Hesitant and uncertain, but still basically our policy with respect to this threat in Asia has been twofold. One part negative, one part positive. The first is don't let them have any more victories. I said a while ago, they're on first base. They've got China. They're trying to get second base to get on to third base, Africa and Latin America to get the home base, the United States. They got first base, keep them on first base. Don't do anything to strengthen the communists. This is why you mustn't trade with them. 
If they aren't an adversary, why are we arming and helping other peoples around the world to enable them to maintain their independence if there isn't a threat to their independence? If there is a threat to their independence that amounts to a threat to us and it's in trouble, why help it out of the trouble? That should seem fairly simple. Don't trade and build up and strengthen the adversary. This is why you mustn't admit red China, red China to the UN. Perhaps you noticed yesterday that the foreign minister of Japan made his major speech at the UN, and he said the UN should continue its prudent course of not admitting red China to the UN, which was extraordinarily strong for him right under the shadow of red China. And they're afraid of the atomic bomb. Japan had them, you know. Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Red China can't hit us. She can't hit France's de Gaulle's France. That's why he thinks he can play along with them. But they can hit Japan. And Japan has no choice except, uh, and Formosa and Korea and the Philippines, all the rest of them, get along with Red China if she's allowed to continue. And a lot of people are urging, have her on to second base as the means of keeping her on first. No, keep her on first. Well, somebody says, but Red China is a represents the biggest country in the world. She ought to be in the UN. No, she ought not to be in the UN. Have you read the UN Charter recently? It was not set up to be an organization of all existing governments that was debated and rejected. It was set up to be a union, united nation of peace-loving, law-abiding nations that would ex re respect fundamental freedoms in order to pool their youth strength against lawlessness and aggression from whatever source. It was not set up to bring the aggressors in. There are gangsters in Chicago. I haven't heard anybody yet suggest that the, you said you came, uh, Mr. Lewis said he came from Chicago. Uh, from what I hear, they sometimes get into the police department down there, but nobody thinks it's a very good idea. And I haven't heard people say, well, since they're there and they got power, we ought to bring them into the FBI because otherwise, how can the FBI plan its campaign to restrain the gangsters if it doesn't have the gangsters in the FBI to help the FBI plan its campaign against the gangsters. <laughs> now you hear that all the time, just, just get through the verbiage. Don't help your enemy, help your friends. But people say, 600 million people have a right to be represented in the parliament of man. Of course they do. But Red China's, the government doesn't represent 600 million people of China. It's exploiting and oppressing those people. People say, well, you can't turn your back or abandon 600 million people. That's right. And then when you, uh, anybody advocates admitting Red China to the UN, they're abandoning, turning their back upon 600 million people. I'm not willing to do that. They say, oh, you're hiding your heads in the sand. No, the people who think they can get along with them have got their heads six feet in the sand. Oh, they say America's stubborn, arbitrary, capriciously, blind. No, no, Red China is stubborn. She won't qualify. I don't know, Dean, but I have a notion that you can't get into Augsburg College without a high school diploma. Even if you got a gun, they won't let you in. <laughs> you have to qualify, qualify. We're not keeping Red China out. She keeps herself out. We've been negotiating with her since 1954. We've had more negotiations with Red China than any other country unless it's the Soviet Union. Much more connections with them than France and England have. And what have we been negotiating about? Two main things, and one of them was this, to try and get them to qualify for membership in the UN by uh, agreeing, as the Charter requires, to refrain from the threat or use of force in international disputes. And she insists on membership and insists on violating all the provisions. Her quarrel with the Soviet Union is over the use of force. Got to use force. UN says membership will be open to all nations that will accept the obligations of the Charter. And the first obligation is to refrain from the threat or use of force in international dispute. She's keeping herself out. We'd love to admit her. I have offered 1,000 times to sponsor when I was in office her membership if she would just qualify. Well, somebody says the Soviet Union doesn't keep the charter either. That's right. But she promised to. We took her in as an ally in the war thinking she would. Red China won't even promise. Now, they've got already got some bad actors in the UN, but don't knowingly bring in some more. 
And then the argument is, well, if you aren't going to let in the red China, why don't you kick the Soviet Union out? Be logical. Logical but useless question. You can't kick the Soviet Union out. It can veto its own expulsion. So what's the use of arguing about what, you're, what you can't do? I believe in the UN. There's not a man in the United States that worked longer and harder and earlier than I have for the UN. Don't drag it down to the level of the gangsters. Thinking thereby you'll please the gangsters. No chip on your shoulder. Just say qualify. The fact that some in we can't get out, that's one of the things you got to accept. But don't wreck it. Of course, they think, they'll say, how are you going to deal with the Red China if you don't have men? The answer is, how do you deal with them if you do have men? You've had the Soviet Union in now 20 years. I challenge anybody to show one instance where we've had the slightest influence on the Soviet Union's policy because of its, through its membership in the UN. This argument is that you can deal with them if you have men is like the argument of the lady who thinks the way to reform a brute is to marry him. It almost never works, although some are always trying it. Why doesn't it work? Because once she's married him, she's lost her bargaining power. Why should he reform now when he's already got her? <laughs> I'll bet you, Dean, that they, the day you matriculate in Augsburg, they don't give you your diploma to show their goodwill. Didn't they show they love you by giving you your diploma the day you matriculate? No, no. You earn it. They give it to you when you graduate. There's an incentive now to work. If you already got it, why should you work? Doors wide open to Red China whenever she'll qualify. Don't build up the adversary. That's the negative. Now, what's the positive side? While not building up the adversary, the positive is to do everything we properly can to strengthen second base, so to speak, the countries around China, from Korea and Japan around to Afghanistan, to strengthen the resistance and the barrier and their capacity to try to defend their own independence, which is what they want and all that we want. Now, how are we doing at this? Well, we've done very well until recently where four conditions are met. Where a new country has a good cause, such as its own independence, that'll mobilize the hearts of people. You can't, couldn't ask the Vietnamese to make the kind of effort necessary to win the struggle when the French were there for a country they weren't sure is going to be their own. And the France, French, we couldn't get them to give independence. Vietnam was lost by the French in Paris. It wasn't lost in Vietnam. They only had one defeat. Not too serious, Dien Bien Phu. Folded up in Paris where they were changing governments every 60 to 90 days. And De Gaulle, one of the reasons he wants us to get out, he thinks he can restore his position of influence. And he thinks they wouldn't have lost Vietnam if he'd have been in charge 11 years ago. I think so too. He'd have given their independence as he did Algeria and he did again. Then worked with them in the French tradition, the French Union. But the fact is, they didn't have a good cause. Now they do have. Second, good leadership. And we can impose that. That's the other side system. Uh, we're not establishing Gauleiters, satellites. Our purpose is to get people to manage their own affairs, not impose our will. We made a mistake or two, and I'll refer to one in just a minute, when we tried to change leadership. In Vietnam, we thought we were going to get something better, got something far worse. A third condition, a good friend. Our forefathers in 1776 had a good cause, national independence. They had the best set of leaders perhaps the world has ever seen at one time in one place. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Franklin, Adams, uh, Hamilton, look at them. Unbelievable. But they still wouldn't have made it without a good friend by the name of France. Don't forget it. In most cases, we have to be the good friend. We're the only one that has the resources. We have always been a wise friend. And Vietnam, one episode, is responsible for a lot of the difficulty. We weren't a wise friend, but we were a generous friend. They knew our purpose was not to pull them down. Our purpose was to help to build them up. Now, one more cause, one more condition. No war within bleeding the nation. No nation can improve its economy and improve its political processes and expand its civil rights when it's at war. I wish I had time to talk about the positive and the negative of this. I'll just mention, wherever those four conditions are met, they're done extraordinarily well. And the most brilliant exhibition is Taiwan, Formosa, Free China. This is the one that everybody thought was most hopeless. Somebody buried that island about once a, or sank it about once a year. And uh, they had a good cause, preserving a culture. They had good leadership. Uh, 
I would say that the two places on our planet where there's the highest concentration of superior leadership today are Taiwan and Israel for exactly the same reason. The most rigid self-selection, camp followers, crooks, uh, people who join up for the right, they don't go into that kind of an austere operation. Only if you've got a torch, something you care about, something you're willing to discipline yourselves for, willing to work for, will you pay that price. So they had a good cause, good leadership. They had a good friend. Instead of our giving them moral lectures, requiring that they balance their budget right after the war with Japan, we couldn't balance our own and became realistic and worked with them these last 12 or 15 years. Uh, and no war, 100 miles of ocean to protect them so they didn't have to bleed, just trying to hold out against the communist rebellion within. They could concentrate on their affairs economically, politically, educationally, medically, industrially, agriculturally. They've made higher progress, faster progress than any other single underdeveloped country in the world. Proof of that is that we could end our aid program three months ago. First program country of more than 100 we've been helping that's achieved its objective, doesn't need any more economic aid from us. This is what people will do not because they're Chinese, what people always will do, given the conditions. Now look at an example of failure, Indonesia. This ought to be the richest of all of them because it's got the greatest natural resources and it's basically out of the struggle, isolated. Its soil is so rich, they tell you out there, if you stick a ruler in the ground, it'll grow. Uh, <laughs> they've got rubber and rice surpluses, everything, but they didn't have a good leader. He, he doesn't know how to build. He's a magnetic personality, really hypnotic. He's a revolutionary. And whatever happens, he can always convince the people it was the fault of the Dutch or the fault of the Malaysians or the fault of the Americans or fault of somebody else. And they move downhill steadily because they haven't got a little good leader. That's all they need. Well, people get indignant. Why don't we kick them out the window? Well, leaders come and go. No man lives forever. But Indonesia is going to be there forever. Take a look at that country. It's as long as the United States and as broad as the United States. A lot of that's water. That's true. But it's location controlling the Japan current that comes up and makes it possible for us to live in Alaska, Oregon, and Washington. And those who are studying oceanography, and the Russians have studied it more than anybody else, are convinced that can be changed, the current, if necessary, to change the climate of the United States. And it comes out. Between, from, between Singapore and uh, Indonesia. And there are below uh, Sukarno at least three extraordinarily superior men. Uh, he isn't going to live forever. You try to hang on until you can get good leadership. There are situations where you have to pull through. I think we should have been sterner with them, but that's a matter of judgment. I don't quarrel with those who disagree. Now, look at the countries where they've had war. I wish I had time for India and Pakistan, but I haven't. Uh, this was the real problem in Vietnam. They had a national cause at last. They had a leader. Recently, General Matthew Maxwell Taylor said, what Vietnam needs is a George Washington. They had a George Washington. We encouraged his overthrow. And they had a war. Now, you can't carry on all the reforms you'd like in a war. Diem did a magnificent job from 55 when he took over to 63. In May of 63, that's a little over two years ago, that war was pretty near won. 10,000 Viet Cong came out of the jungle in the month of May and laid down their arms. Said it's a lost cause. We don't even have sweet potatoes to eat, let alone rice, and we can't get supplies. Because the key thing was they can't get supplies directly by land from North Vietnam. The only Feasible routes go over through Laos. They had practically given up. Secretary of Defense McNamara came before the Congress, and if you look up the testimony, it's in publicized. He said, the young has produced a miracle. Land reform, uh, agricultural development, uh, increasing not only the grade schools, elementary schools, but the college level from 2,000 students there when the French were in control to 11,500 after eight years and uh, settled a million refugees from the north who chose 
whatever disaster, rather than to live under communism in North Vietnam and with no major incident and build highways and airstrips. It was a miracle. Mr. McNamara said, we can bring 1,700 of our Americans home in 63. It's so much better. And we did bring 1,700 home in 63. And he said, we can bring the rest of them in 64 and 65. Instead, we've sent back about 150,000. More than 10 times as many as were there when McNamara was speaking. Why? Because we helped change the leadership. Now, why did they decide Diem had to go? The basic reason was he wouldn't knuckle under to our neutralization of Laos. I, in Manila, the head of one of the most strongly anti-communist countries in Asia, lying very close to the Chinese border, uh, refused to issue the normal invitation to the conference to meet in his country next year. And this is a very high official in that country. And when asked why, he said, look at Laos. How do we know what your position will be a year from now? The American position. He knew that we scolded India for trying to be neutral. And we scolded Indonesia for trying to be neutral. Why don't you ally yourself with the free world? Laos, Laos had brave men who allied themselves 100% with the free world. And we decided, really, they ought to become neutral while we scolded others for being neutral. And bring the communists in to their government against their wishes in a coalition. Our own ambassador in Vietnam rejected it hard as he could and was thrown out because of his opposition. Our own commander in chief, Admiral Harry Felt, commander in chief of the whole Pacific headquarters in Honolulu, told us in 59, 60, 61, and 62, you can look it up in the printed hearings of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the key to Vietnam is Laos. The key to Vietnam is Laos. The logistics and communications are on our side in Laos. They're against us in Vietnam. Don't open up by the coalition government, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. At that time, there were no mortars in South Vietnam. They were not able to blast Vietnamese or Americans. These have all come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail since we forced Laos into neutralism. Diem fought it. And he was irritating. All strong men are strong. And they decided we ought to have somebody more pliant over there, pliable. Now, they couldn't kick him out because he was winning. You know, that wouldn't look right. And uh, so they had to have two other reasons, and they devised two others. One was that Diem wasn't giving the people of Vietnam full civil rights. He had some people in concentration camps, which was true. Happens in all countries. The United States, after Pearl Harbor, was scared. And we took almost 100,000 American-born citizens, tore up the Constitution in the United States and the Bill of Rights, and threw them in concentration camps and kept them there three years without a single hostile word or act by one of them. That's what we did to civil rights. Diem never had anything like that. What did England do? The mother of parliaments the law at war. The laws of England required a general election at least every five years. Churchill just disobeyed the laws. They were at war. They didn't hold any for 10 years. This is what all countries do at war. How do you expect it not to happen in a country that's only eight years old? Now, the other argument was that he was a Roman Catholic and because of his religion was persecuting Buddhists. This was not true. And this is the most shameful. There are 4,688 Buddhist pagodas in uh, Vietnam. He closed less than 30. That's all. And he closed them because every one of them was openly agitating overthrow of the government. The languages of that country are Vietnamese and French. But great signs on these pagodas. Down with the Nojimen, Nojinjem click and so on. Usually in English. So you could see them in American newspapers. And you did. And on American television. And it did your job. I don't think the United States government at war would allow... Uh, somebody, hostile forces to occupy a cathedral or a synagogue or a Lutheran church and have great signs on it, down with the president of the United States and his rotten clique. We wouldn't do it, would we? Neither did Mo Jin Jim. But 
what was done of necessity as a part of attempt to win a war was said because he was a Roman Catholic, and this wasn't true. And the proof of it is, there are many I could give you, but the main one is the United Nations itself. Ambassador of Costa Rica introduced a resolution in the United Nations to censor Diem for religious persecution in violation of the Declaration of Human Rights. And Diem asked the, sent the UN to send over a committee and investigate it, and they did, and they put the ambassador of Costa Rica as the chairman. And they went over and investigated, they said in their report, every single charge that was brought to them, and they advertised people to bring to them complaints of religious persecution, and went back and filed a report, it's that thick, and found no convincing evidence of persecution of Buddhists on a religious basis. Did you hear that played up in the press? No. There were two newspaper people who went after the truth. One was named Marguerite Higgins, and one was named Joseph Alsop. They didn't publish the stuff that was handed to them from underlings in our government. They went out in the countryside. They said there was no religious persecution. They were right. They took the trouble to find the facts, but the American people read the others. Uh, it's shameful. Well, just one illus more, more illustration. You all saw pictures of Buddhist priests burning themselves in the streets of Vietnam. Uh, how could we support a government that was oppressing people to the point where they were burning themselves? There, were, there was one Buddhist priest who burned himself in the streets of Vietnam. There were five others who were dragged, who were drugged, so the UN said, and dragged there after giving all the newspapers and the, and the uh, uh, picture taken of machinery, the photographers, the chance to come there and know exactly what moment, what corner, so they could get the picture. And we saw those pictures. There were seven burned themselves in the streets within two months after the death of Nga Jin Jim. I never saw a picture of one of those in the United States. Now you see what can be done. I don't blame the newspapers. They were passed out what was handed to them, except for a couple who were sufficiently enterprising to get the truth. Diem made one fatal mistake. He thought we were trying to win a war. He knew that when we were fighting against Hitler and trying to win a war, we didn't say to Stalin, now, Mr. Stalin, if you let out all your political prisoners and quit persecuting religions and have democratic elections, we will help you. Oh, no. We poured in $12 billion and asked not one question. We were trying to win a war. Diem said to me one time, why does your country always demand perfectionism of your allies? But you don't demand democratic reforms of Tito or your enemies or others when you give them aid. And this is the thing that's left the people of Asia very, very anxious. Now the key questions, can you get the Vietnamese together politically and with the full will to fight? The answer is yes, if you can get the United States together. The great weakness is the United States. You can't ask them to be more united of support of President Johnson's policies in Vietnam than senators of his own party are united in Washington. If there isn't stability regarding our administration's policy in Washington, how can you ask it elsewhere? This was the number one question at the Manila conference. I told you at the beginning, many things favorable, and then they don't know what to do about the United States. The man from this country says, look at Laos. How do we know what your position will be a year from now? Now, you and I consider it to be an evidence, and it is, of our mature democracy that anybody can say what he wants, but they don't believe that the president's chief lieutenant, uh, the, the majority leader in the United States Senate, could get up and condemn our president's policy or oppose it if the president really were firm, no matter what the president say. They don't believe it. They know that the goals chief lieutenant couldn't get up and oppose him without resigning as the chief lieutenant. Harold Wilson made a speech yesterday. You read about at the labor conference in England. And a lot of people opposed him, but they can't get up in parliament and oppose him without getting out of the party. And Wayne Morse, I heard this when I was out there. Wayne Morse said that people were demanding in the United States the impeachment of President Johnson. This was played up by the hour on Peking Radio and Hanoi Radio. And those people out there scared to death. The United States is about to fall apart. Our first task, get ourselves together. We, don't, we can't quite afford the luxury 
of all of this when you're fighting a war and kids are giving their lives out there. That boy's only got one life. That's all he's got. You have no right to ask him to give a life for a policy that's been worked out according to our democratic processes, even though you may not agree with all the policies in the midst of war. And the third thing that's necessary, if we can get our allies together, the real key, as I said in the beginning, is to get the free, the stronger, older nations together. What about de Gaulle? I got to say a word about that. De Gaulle wrote 12 years ago that he feared the United States would prove to be the Carthage of our era of human history. You remember Carthage? Wonderful climate, north shore of Africa, protected by the Mediterranean, most of whose rich commerce it controlled. Affluent society in Carthage, interested in sports, pleasure, didn't want trouble. And up on a rocky peninsula, mountainous peninsula, Italy, were some people saying Carthage must be destroyed. The ancient equivalent of the, we will bury you, Carthage. We will bury you, Carthage. And Carthage didn't want trouble, and so she made concessions. And she showed her goodwill, and she made concession and went down. Mr. de Gaulle, I don't agree with him, but this is what he thinks, that we've become soft in our pursuit of pleasure and so on. Comfort, leisure, and that we haven't got the will. We'll be the Carthage of our era of history. Second, he doesn't think we're going to hold on. In Vietnam, he reads Walter Lippmann too. Uh, he thinks we're going to pull out. He isn't going to give up Vietnam. He's going to try to restore the French sphere of influence in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And he hopes he can influence Red China. And the objective, I was in France this spring for some time. They're very clear about what it is. They aren't afraid of Red China. It can't hit France. They are afraid of the Soviet Union. It can hit France. Machiavelli said, if you've got an enemy coalition which is disintegrating, help the weaker member, not the stronger. We're helping the Soviet Union the stronger. He's going to help the weaker one. Hoping that he can keep Red China in the ring, the Soviet Union will have to spend so much time watching Red China, the Soviet Union can't make trouble for Mr. de Gaulle's France. Now, what he's doing is a disaster. He won't have any more influence in, in, on Red China than we have had on the Soviet Union, but you can't really jump on him for following our example, can you? The thing that really tipped them off, touched them off, they tell you, was the hotline to Moscow. If we'd have put in a hotline from Washington to Paris, and one to London, and one to Bonn, and one to Rome, and then one to Moscow, we'd have had no trouble. But they say, you got a hotline your president and Mr. Khrushchev or his successors are talking about. What are they talking about? They must be talking about something. <laughs> what are they talking about? Well, he thinks they're talking about what are we going to do with the goal? There is no country that will turn over its destiny to a man in Washington and a man in an enemy country, Moscow, we wouldn't, they won't. And we offended them by excluding our friends and putting our trust in our enemies. Can't trust our friends. And this is the disarray that alarms me more than anything else. Oh, what do we do? Very quickly. Well, we could ignore it, drift, sweep it under the rug, say it's a bad dream, communism mellowing, convergence, all these things you heard. Disaster. Another, we could imagine that communism is an economic phenomenon and it'll disappear with greater social justice and higher living standards. No evidence to support that. If communism was an economic phenomenon, the last country in America, which in Latin America, which would have become communist is Cuba because it had the highest living standards. South Korea had much better living standards than North Korea. It wasn't the South Koreans that became communists, the North. South Italy is very poor, almost no communism. Rich, North uh, Italy is very rich, communism all over the place. What leads people to communists? Communism. Communists do. What led you to Christianity or whatever you believe? A person, a book you read, a preacher, a teacher, a friend, a mother. It's persons that lead people into view. They use poverty as an excuse. They rejoice that wherever there's something they can inflame. face up to the facts, not to accept them, but to change them. When the communists had their first World Congress in, Mo in London in 1905, they had 48 people. They faced a world totally hostile. 
They didn't deny it. They set out to change it. Face facts, not to accept them and bow down before them. Change them. The American Revolution is the real revolution. This is the one that's made possible the changes. We are the ones who excited the hopes in other people. Why should we lose faith in our revolution? For building, creating, constructing, and leave people in despair with no hope except to go to the revolutions that divide and destroy. Face up to the facts. They're tough, but there's no reason for despair. We must recognize that we're at war in Vietnam. And it's the only war we were ever in danger of losing. And there's only one reason we're in danger of losing this war, and that's because we're not fighting it in dead earnest. And why aren't we fighting it in dead earnest? Because it isn't called war, it's called peace. Read the Overstreet's book. They're not right-wing extremists. First great scholars. The war called peace. The war called peace. As long as it's called peace, we don't pull our belts tight. We just send out boys to die, but the rest of us enjoy life. We've got to decide as a nation to stop communist expansionism, not because we're partial to the Vietnamese, but because further expansionism reduces the world in which free men can live. Make the people of Vietnam and our allies and the neutrals and the communists know that this is a national decision. And it's not just President Johnson with his war, it's the people of the United States with misgivings here and there, but this is a national policy been decided upon. He said it again and again, but they aren't going to believe it as long as his lieutenants say the opposite. And I just one word of counsel for the president. I wish he wouldn't, on top of his assurances that we won't give in, go ahead and say, but of course we have, we have no uh, desire for overthrow of uh, the government in Vietnam or Peking. This paralyzes people. They say, you don't care about our freedom, just want to protect yourself. Whether we're free or slaves doesn't make any difference. Oh, you don't have to drop bombs. We do care about the freedom of all mankind. And the people in Asia know that if the Chinese communists are able to consolidate and exploit the full potential of China, there is no hope for them. Uh, Japan knows that. Philippines know it. You can't say them. On the other hand, if the Chinese people can be given a chance and hope to become free from within and friendly as they will be. There's no insoluble problem in Asia. No insoluble problem if China's free and friendly. If it's under the communists, no solution. However difficult the tasks of facing up to this, any other course has greater difficulty. Now, why don't we do it? There's one reason that I'm through. Fear. 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 Fear that confrontation will lead to escalation. Those two words paralyze more people than I've ever seen. Confrontation will lead to escalation. You assert it and read it everywhere. Nobody proves it. Look at the facts. Eleven times in these 19 years, under three presidents, we have said no. Even though they threatened atomic war over Berlin and Kimoy and Lebanon and Cuba. Eleven times we said no. This can't be. Lead to war? Escalation? No. Each time, in effect, they said, so sorry, we just wanted to know, and racked our way. <laughs> and the last one was just last week. Red China was going to do this and that in India and Pakistan. And when nobody gave in, they extended the ultimatum and then withdrew it. Now, they're careful. They're not reckless. Khrushchev was reckless and adventurous. He talked peace, relax, good old grandpa while he was putting missiles into Cuba. Red China's not done one reckless thing. They're not going to take a chance on losing all they've been working for for 45 years. Of all the probabilities, anything can happen. This is the least likely. I am afraid of escalation when we hesitate, are divided, vacillate, give the impression so that everybody knows how nice we are, that we don't really mean business. Don't get a chip on our shoulder. Don't call them names. Don't engage in hatred. Just face up to this coolly, with patient firmness and strength in support of human freedom and our own principles and our own history and our allies. This is the way to avoid escalation. Let me close with one paragraph from Winston Churchill. He died early this year and everybody praised him as they ought to. Most, uh, I didn't see this, which I think was the greatest moment in his history. Any head of a government, I hope, 
will defend his own country and his own people. But what do you do when there's nothing involved but your word? And it's, dis it's disadvantageous. And you have people saying, well, we must reduce our commitments, which is a polite way of saying we must reduce our word or break our word again. In the winter of 1940, uh, Hitler sent his Panzer divisions into Greece. They just kicked the British off the continent at Dunkirk. They were free and they moved into Greece. Churchill's predecessor, not he, had entered into a mutual defense assistance pact, if you wish, with Greece. Churchill could have said, I didn't make this agreement. The Greeks, snowed under, called for help. And Mr. Churchill sent one third of all the British forces in North Africa fighting with their back to the wall to hold back Rommel from getting the Suez Canal so that supplies and men could come from the daughter countries, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. And Mr. Churchill was torn to pieces in England by the same people that are tearing Lyndon Johnson to pieces, same kind of people. Cream of America or England's crop being slaughtered for a bad, rotten, fascistic, divided, corrupt government in Greece or Vietnam or somewhere else. And Mr. Churchill went on the air, April 27, 1941, eight, almost eight months before we were in the war. He had no way knowing that England would make it. And this is what he said to the British. In their mortal peril, the Greeks turned to us for succor. Strained as were our own resources, we could not say them nay. By solemn guarantee given before the war, Great Britain had promised them her help. They declared they would fight for their native soil even if none of their neighbors made common cause with them, and even if we left them to their fate. But we could not do that. There are rules against that kind of thing. And to break those rules would be fatal to the honor of the British Empire, without which we could neither hope nor deserve to win this hard war. Churchill didn't save Greece, but he saved England. Military defeat may be humiliating, but it's not fatal. Moral default for a world leader is final and fatal. You're a part of an academic community. You're privileged. You have a chance to study history and study the sources of this country's own greatness. You're trustees of a way that's based on honor and the pledged word and integrity. And your country needs you right now. Thank you.